outing. With that said, come on, let's get into the word. I'm excited to deliver a word today. I got to be honest with you. There's a series of sermons that have been presented here in this house, and I believe that God is doing something special with impact. I believe that God has been orchestrating a word like no other. God is asking us to change our perspective. He's saying the situation that you've been going through isn't bigger than me. In fact, if you're going through a test, I will submit to you today that God doesn't want you to tackle on the problems of tomorrow with today's strength. God is advising you today that I'm working it all out and you're not alone. So let's go open up the word, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 8. I'm going to be reading from the message translation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 8, and it reads as follows. That's why we live with such good cheer. You won't see us drooping our heads or dragging our feet. In fact, cramped conditions here don't get us down. They only remind us of the spacious living conditions ahead. It's what we trust in but don't yet see that keeps us going. Do you suppose a few ruts in the road or rocks in our path are going to stop us? When the time comes, we'll be plenty ready to exchange exile for homecoming. Come on. Come on. The title of today's message is, I'm stuck in the middle. I'm stuck. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm stuck in the middle. When you're faced with a test, know that there is a thin line between fear and faith. That thin line in the middle is called your perspective, meaning in the midst of your situation, you can either choose fear or you can choose faith. But what you can't do is stay stuck in the middle. Now, now, what is a test? The Hebrew word for test is nosaw, nosaw. And it simply means to be put to the test, to be tempted, to be tried. Anybody been tried before? Come on, I know you've been trying. A a test for us looks like this, a trial, a tribulation. I'm going through some pain, through some hurt. I've gone through some affliction, through some agony. I'm going through a, a season of desperation and despair. But when I have faith, I have a constant outlook of trust and dependency on God. When I have faith, I know that he's worked it all out. In fact, when I have faith, even though I don't know where I'm going, I don't have a line of sight. Guess what? I know I'll get there. When I have faith, I can trust on God's word. If he did it before, he'll do it again. When I have faith in God, I know that I can praise him in the morning and I can praise him in the evening, right? I can praise him in my good and I can praise him in my bad. I can praise him in the mountain top or I can praise him in the valley. When I have trust in God, I know that my current living conditions is no match for the homecoming that awaits me on the other side. But just because I have faith, just because I walk by faith and not by sight, doesn't mean that I won't end up in a hot mess. Come on, somebody. When you're in the middle of a test, fear sets in. When you're in the middle of a test, I become discouraged. When I'm in the middle of a test, regardless of the decision that I make, I have no control over the outcome. When I'm in the middle of a test, there's displeasure, there's dissatisfaction, there's discontent. When I'm stuck in the middle, I'm frustrated. I was traveling not so long ago, and I was going to New York. And I knew exactly where I was going. I knew exactly where I was going to sit, simply because I had purchased my tickets a year ago. Now, before I tell you the story, don't judge. <laughs> I'm letting you know right now. If you don't, online, if you don't know me, you will get to know me right now. I have preferences. I have preferences. 
when I buy my two seats, I'm buying the two most uh, available seats in the front. I'm going to sit in the aisle. I'm going to sit in the front, and I'm going to sit in the aisle. I don't want to sit in the middle, and I don't want to sit in the back. Simple as that. I get to the airport, and I'm unable to check in. And when I get to the airport, I tell the poor guy at the ticket counter, I say, hey, my tickets, I can't check in. And he checks me in, and he says, here are your seats. And I quickly realize that the seats that I had purchased aren't the seats that I'm in. And he says, sir, I apologize. I need you to go to the gate, and they'll switch it out at the gate. And I get to the gate, and the lady says, the plane has been reconfigured. There's some changes and now you're sitting in the middle of two individuals. My nickname here in this house is Flocko, and that means slim. There's nothing slim at my 45 years, 47 years of life. There's nothing slim about me, and I'm stuck in the middle of two individuals. This was the case for the people of Israel when they were crossing the Red Sea. They were stuck in the middle of the Red Sea and uh, Pharaoh's army. They were in a situation where they needed a miracle. If you recall the story, they left Ramesses to Succoth. And from Succoth, the word says that they kept in Etham. Now, I need you to understand that Etham is a decision point for the people of Israel. Etham can be a spiritual decision point in your life. Etham, there's three choices. I could either turn back to Egypt. In Egypt, is the place that I know. Egypt is where my bread and butter is, or my bread and water. But Etham is also the place of my slavery. Etham is the place of my bondage. Etham is the place of my affliction. If I don't go to east, back to Egypt, then I could head due east. Now, they were on the cusp of the wilderness, and it was easy for them to get out of Pharaoh's way. They could get away from Pharaoh far enough. But here's the thing about heading due east. If I'm heading due east, God said he was going to give me a promised land. He just didn't tell me when. So I could head due east towards the promised land in hopes that I get there. But I'm going to have to go through some Philistine territory. So I might be tested. I just don't know if I'm going to get there. I'm hoping that I get there. But if I don't get there, what if? The third decision is this. The third decision is to head due south and listen to God. One is based on knowledge. One is based on hope, and one is based on obedience. May I submit to you that faith isn't an act of knowledge. Faith isn't an act of hope. Faith is an act of obedience. They were heading south in what seemed to be the wrong way. God will sometimes lead you what seems to be the wrong way at the right time for the right reason to confuse the right people. Sometimes God will allow you to be stuck in the middle of a situation because your test creates endurance, your test creates patience, your test creates perseverance. Turn with me to James chapter 1 verse 2 and 3. My brethren, count it all, count it all what? When you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. I got another one for you. Hebrews 10, 35. Hebrews 10, 35. The Passion Translation says, So don't lose your bold, courageous faith, for you are destined for a great reward. You need the strength of endurance to reveal the poetry of God's will, and then you receive the full promise. Amen? Amen. Point number one, faith without obedience is dead. See, faith comes first, and then comes obedience. Amen? 
Moses is heading down what seems to be the wrong way. He's being led by the wisdom of God. And it's not a popular decision. In fact, if you understand this, the elders of Israel, they knew that he was heading down a place where they would be stuck. The word says in Exodus 14, as Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians taking, overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you that this would happen? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. Impact translation, God, why have you forsaken me? Why did you bring me to this place right now? There's no resolution. There's no place to go. But this is where you want me. What could cause such a fear that I would rather go back to bondage? I would rather go back to affliction. I would rather go back to slavery. My God. Don't we serve an almighty God? Didn't God who created us, who's alpha and omega, who's beginning and the end, who placed the moon and the stars in the sky, and he knows each one by name? Didn't he recognize that when he was putting everything together on his uh, app, on his navigation app, on his spiritual iPhone, right? Didn't he realize that he was going to uh, lead the people of Israel to a place of no return? My God, the word says, though, that the Lord was with them. In fact, it highlights the fact that he was with them with a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. Don't allow, allow your eye to fool your mind. Sometimes your eye will allow you to focus on the thing that is in front of you without realizing that the shift should be on God. On what's on your mind, the renewal of your mind. And sometimes we look at the thing that's in front of us and we question and we doubt whether it is bigger than God. May I submit to you again, there's nothing bigger than God. In fact, faith will have you declaring Psalms 23, 4. Even when your path takes me through the valley of the deepest darkness, fear won't conquer me. For you already have. Your authority is my strength. Your authority is my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I will never be lonely for you are near. I don't know what you're going through today, but you're probably in the same situation as the people of Israel were in. You're stuck in the middle of a situation. On one side, there's uh, discomfort. There's confusion. There's concern. There's an inconsolable spirit. And on the other side, there is a mighty army that's barreling down on you. The word says that there were 600 chariots. But let me give you some uh, point of reference. 600 chariots by design, the amount of people that it took to move 600 chariots, it's about a quarter million of of Pharaoh's army. So we're not talking about just simply 600 chariots. Uh, chariots. We're talking about an entire army. But watch this. And Moses says to the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians that you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Be still and know that he's God. There's some things that you're going through and God's trying to remind you that the Egyptians in your life that you've seen today, you won't see it tomorrow. God will give us a word, but it doesn't work if you don't trust it while you're in the middle of that situation. See, faith takes God without any ifs. But if God said it, then faith says, I believe it. Faith says, amen to it. 
Fear will have you asking, what if? What if the army of Pharaoh arrives? What if the army of Pharaoh takes us out at the sea, at the, at the shores of the Red Sea? What if I can't make it to the other side? But faith, faith will have you say, even if. Even if Pharaoh's army arrives, even if Pharaoh's army takes me out, even if I can't make it to the other side, even if the cancer doesn't go away, even if the relationship isn't restored, I will still praise God. I will still move about his will. And so God's plan to the situation was to call Moses to obedience. Point number two, don't fear your purpose. Have faith in your purpose. The reason why Moses could encourage the people to be still is because Moses understood doubt. Let me take you back, give you some context. In chapter 3 of Exodus, Moses sees something unique. It's a burning bush. There's nothing unique about an actual burning bush. It's the wilderness. So it's okay to see a burning bush. The difference between this one is is that it it didn't consume. It didn't burn out. God was in the middle of this burning bush. And God begins to speak to Moses, calls him out twice. Moses, Moses. In other words, I got something important to tell you. And he says, I have seen the suffering of the Israelites in the land of Egypt. I want you to lead them into a land of freedom and save them from slavery and suffering. And Moses begins to question God. He says, who am I? Who am I that you would bestow upon me this big task? And sometimes we're like that with God. Sometimes in the process of our faith, we're like, we begin to question God. Who am I? And it's not a who am I like I'm afraid of what you're asking. It's who am I like humbly. Like who am I that you would, you would call me to be your mouthpiece. You would call me to lead your people. Who am I? I'm nothing but a, a shepherd. I've been a shepherd for the last 40 years. Moses has been a murderer. Who am I? And I understood at this moment what Moses was feeling. I believe I do. I was in the middle of Bible college, in the first semester of Bible college, and I remember one moment where one of our professors began to pray over the class, and she began to prophesy. And when she got to me, she tells me, take off your shoes, and I want you to do three laps around this room. And so I did the three laps, and she began to pray over me, and she began to prophesy over me. And it's in that moment that it began to weep. Have you ever been in the presence of God? I'm talking about, have you ever been sloppy in the presence of God? I'm talking about, you cry like a little kid, snot nose. You out there. The class, after the class, the class say, no, nah, Flocka, you cry like, you cry real ugly. <laughs> you ever tell somebody, somebody tells you you cry very ugly? What do you do when your next can change the world? What do you do when God Almighty comes down from heaven above and sits down right next to you and asks you to be obedient? Would you fear or would you operate in faith? See, because there is something about the presence of God that even if you doubt yourself, even if you want to say no, you can't say no. Because the presence of God is overwhelming. The presence of God is... God will often put things in our lives bigger than what we can handle. And it's there so that we can realize our faith needs to be on him so he can move what we can't move. Listen to God's response when Moses began to say, who am I? He said, but I'll be there. God, who am I? You want me to do, but I'll be there. But God, what if, but, but, I, but I'll be there. 
But God, you, you want me to do what? Yeah, but I, I told you I'm going to be there. Yeah. But you want me to take this step? But I told you I'm going to be there. The opposite of faith is fear. And it starts with a seed of doubt. And if you cultivate it, and if you water that doubt, that seed can turn into a fruit of disobedience. And so when God allows you to go through a storm, it's not to destroy you, it's to show you how good he is. We're standing in front of the Red Sea. And I need you to understand that we're not talking about a small group of people. 600,000 men. 600,000 men times 2.5 growth rate. 12 tribes over 400 years. Carry the one, multiply it by pi, 3.14. Add some A, B, C's and some X, Y, Z's for you math individuals. You get an estimated 2.4 to 3 million people. The route that they took, what I believe, based on my research, the route that they took, the word says that they were stuck. They were at the seashore, behind them the wilderness, and the army of Pharaoh coming down. They're standing there in the middle of the day, and I need you to understand that by design, your naked eye can only see 2.9 to 7 miles into the horizon. 2.9 to 7 miles. But the point of crossing was 8 to 9 miles. Now, I'm trying to paint a picture because I can't see the land. I can see the mountain range, but I can't see the land. But I can see the mountain range. So I know where I want to go, but I can't see it. And it's in the middle of the day, so I can see the mountain range, but I can't see a solution. But I can see the mountain range. But I can't get there. What am I supposed to do? The word says that when God parted the Red Sea, he didn't do it during the day. He did it at night. Meaning that everything that God does, he does it in the extreme. He does it at the point where there's no hope left. He does it at the point where you just believe that it can't be done. I know where I want to go. I know where my salvation is. I just can't get there. It was during the darkest hour that God came through. Point number three. You have to have faith in the midnight hour. God didn't part the Red Sea when the people of Israel requested it. God doesn't show up when you begin to cry out. God will allow you to Wait a little bit. I think, I think Minister Kelly ministered this Saturday morning prayer. You're going to have to wait a little while. God didn't show up when he knew that the people of Israel can see where they wanted to go. He showed up when it was pitch black. Now, I need you to understand. You want me to what? You want me to go in the middle of the sea at nighttime. If I'm standing next to Moses, I'm like, hey, bro, what you want me to do? <laughs> you, you want me to do what? <laughs> when, when God's perfection meets your circumstance, that's what we call suddenly. When, 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 when you're not yet meets God so heaven's already done. That's what we call it. We don't have a context for it, so we call it a miracle, right? And so what transpired in that moment is God's invincible kingdom met your visible situation. The power of God's invisible kingdom over your visible situation. He showed up suddenly, but here's the perspective point. It's sudden to you. It's not sudden to God. God's already been orchestrating that. It's just sudden to you. There's a moment in your situation where you just got to praise. You got to be like Paul and Silas. When Paul and Silas were locked up, 
They were praising through the midnight hour. The word says that suddenly an earthquake occurred. Suddenly their chains fell off. Suddenly the doors began to open. In this moment, suddenly God is saying, I'm going to part the Red Sea for you. Suddenly I'm going to make it happen for you. And so here's the thing. You think that you're stuck in the middle of a situation. But may I submit to you that you're not stuck in the middle of a situation. You're in the middle of two points. You're in the midpoint of your coming and of your going. You're in the middle of your bare bones and your blessings. You're in the middle of your place of destitute and your place of destiny. You're in the middle of your faith and the middle of your future. You're in the middle of your sickness and the middle of your healing. You're in the middle of your exile and you're in the middle of your expectation. And the reason why God is testing you, the reason why you keep going through the things that you're going through, the reason why you show up and you don't have a solution for it, the reason why you're being tested and expanded and pushed is because God is trying to build up that endurance. God is trying to build up that perseverance. God is trying to build up that patience. Because if I could build up your endurance and your patience and your perseverance, then I could prepare you for what I have in store for you. Because what I have in store for you is much bigger than what you think you have. It's much bigger than your current situation. If I could just get you to understand that if you prayed a little bit more and if you fasted a little bit more and if you began to ask me and put your dependency on me, I can make it happen for you. The reason why you keep getting tested is because God is trying to build up your faith. And here's the crazy thing about faith. Faith will say, God, I need a miracle. But God is trying to explain to you that when I part the seas for you, I'm just not parting the seas. It's just not a miracle. I'm setting you up for your new norm. Your miracle is just not a miracle. It's the new standard of you living. It's the new standard of your situation. It's the new standard for your relationship. It's the new standard for your health. It's the new standard for what God has in store for you. You're not stuck in the middle. Faith doesn't eliminate the distraction. Faith eliminates the fear. And if I could just position you to receive what I have in store for you. If you could just shift your faith. If you could just stop looking at the impossible in your life. If I can just get you to just just step into this new season. See, you're not just crossing the Red Sea. You're walking into your new season right now. You're stepping into your new season. You're saying bye-bye to affliction and bye-bye to your agony and bye-bye to your pain and bye-bye to your hurt. And I'm stepping in into God's grace. And I'm stepping into my new season of love. And I'm stepping into my new season of his mercy. And I'm stepping into the new season of what he has over my life. If you could just have a little bit of faith. If you could just have just a little bit of faith. The word says that if my faith could be the size of a must, he doesn't take, it doesn't take much. If my faith was the size of a mustard seed, I could move mountains. I can move mountains because greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. And if he's for me, then who could be against me? Father, hallelujah. If you could just have a little bit of faith. 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 My God. There's some parallels. In comparison between Moses and Jesus. See, during that time, the people had to go to the prophet if they wanted to go to the Lord. They wanted to go to God. The people of Israel, the people of Israel didn't have the same relationship that we currently have with Jesus. The people of Israel 
told Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. But don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. But that's not God's will for you today. Here's the parallel between Moses and Jesus. Moses, in Moses' time, Pharaoh wanted to wipe out children under the age of two. In Jesus' time, Pharaoh wanted to do the same thing. When Moses was born, he was placed in a basket in the Nile River. Jesus was placed in a basket upon birth. Pharaoh, or Moses I should say, was given the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Moses came from royalty. Jesus came from royalty too. So I want to give you the opportunity today to know who Jesus is in your life. Eyes closed, heads bowed. Nobody moving except those that are assigned to. I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know the situation that you're going through. But I suspect that there's somebody here who's stuck in the middle of a situation. There's somebody here who's at the edge of the Red Sea and they're looking and searching for a miracle. And there may be a part of you that's doubting. There may be a part of you that you begin to question God. God, am I worthy to receive your grace? Am I worthy to receive this miracle? You are worthy. Because God himself sent his son to die on the cross of Calvary for you. To pay the ultimate price. So with your eyes closed, heads bowed, nobody moving. I'm going to give you an opportunity to get to know Jesus. I just simply want you to raise your hand up on a count of three. Do it quickly because sometimes the enemy will place doubt in your mind. So on a count of three, if you want to get to know the Lord, if you want to have an intimate relationship with a God that will make a way, that will bring a miracle into your life, then do me a favor, lift your hands up right now. Lift up your hands. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Praise God. I see that hand. I see that hand. I'm going to give you, I see that hand. Because see, God is, Holy Spirit is orchestrating a move right now. Praise God. For those that raised their hand, just repeat after me. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here in your presence today. I come before you asking for your forgiveness. Father God, save me now. Remove the stains out of my life. I boldly proclaim at this moment that I am born again. I receive you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.